You are watching Adjuster TV. What is the future of insurance? I don't know. I don't know my future. I don't know your future, and I certainly don't know the future of insurance. But today I'm going to interview somebody who thinks they do have an insight into what the future of insurance is going to look like and how we can be a part of it. Hey IAs and welcome to the Auto IA Show by IA Path. At IA Path, we help new IAs get the two to five year experience requirement waived with over 20 companies with our 90 day online virtual mentorship program. If you're interested, head over to IAPath.com. So today I'm gonna to be talking with Brian Falchuk, the new author of a book called The Future of Insurance. Now this Brian guy has some serious experience and claims and he has some knowledge and information that he's gonna pass on to us. As the head of claims at Hiscox USA and at his insure tech company he now works at, he's seen where the insurance industry is going and he wants to give us a glimpse and help paint a picture for us of how we can be a part of it. For all the best tips, tricks, and tools, head on over to Adjuster TV's YouTube channel and click the subscribe button while you're there. Don't forget to hit the bell notification so you get notified every time we have a new video. So let's bring Brian on and go ahead and dive deep into the future of insurance. But first, do you need errors and emissions, general liability, drone insurance, or even cyber liability coverage? Then let me tell you about our sponsor, Claims Professionals Liability Insurance Company, or CPLIC. Founded 16 years ago by independent adjusters, four independent adjusters, they wanna give you peace of mind while you work with the insured. To apply, head over to cplic.net today. All right, IAs, I'm joined by Brian Falchuk. Uh, he's got a new book out, The Future of Insurance, From Disruption to Evolution. And I've uh, taken a look at the book. Um, but honestly, Brian, I got a question for you is, yeah. we as independent adjusters, we know the insurance company's changing. We see the writing on the wall, so to speak, that there's big changes coming. And the question we all want to know from somebody like you is, are we even going to be needed as independent adjusters in, in the coming years? Yeah. So Chris, um, to answer that, I, I want to set a really quick scene for you. 2017, the first Connected Claims Conference, I was one of the speakers there and they had live questions going up during all the panels and the questions had nothing to do with what the panel was about. It was all, it was all like, am I going to be out of a job? How much longer do I have left? I mean, like, and so they never asked any of the live questions because like for the organizers, I think they felt awkward like putting all these like chief claims officers on the spot or whatever. <laughs> but that's yeah, but like clearly that's what people care about. And of course, like half the people were presenting about drones. So it's like, dude, that's like, that's what I do. Um, you know, well, so do I think that IAs are going to be around in the future of insurance? Absolutely. But it's going to look different. And I think pretty much every role in almost every industry is going to look different and putting aside the whole COVID-19 thing where like the way that we all work is changing. I've had IAs come to my house three different times. Um, I didn't do it. Something happened. Claim in my house. I might've done some of them. It's not my fault. It's not my fault. <laughs> I might've screwed up our humidifier and our heating system once, but the other two, that was not my fault. Um, two out of three were unbelievable. The other one, I adjusted the claim and like, luckily I'm a claims guy. So my carrier um, ended up saving a few grand because their person didn't do anything. And I did, but uh, the, the two who, who were great, it was not droneable. Um, mm -hmm. It was not appable. And I am so thankful that I had them because they're the ones who helped see the thing through. Not, you know, like the person at the carrier was fine, but actually it was the feet on the street that was the most helpful for me. Like we had a fence blown down and like, that's the guy who really got me in a good place because this is what he does. And so he gave me all this guidance that you know, the person on the phone, like they'll have their script and they'll know stuff for sure. <laughs> yeah. But like he's living it and he only does like cat adjusting. So he, you know, like he just had an expertise that from a customer standpoint, I was so thankful that it's not like I wouldn't have been happy if they were like, Oh yeah, we flew a drone over. Like, here's your check. 
but I got something out of that conversation with him. So I was thankful for that. And that wasn't a complex claim. Complex claims, even more important. So totally. I now, think Brian, IAs will always be around. So you think IAs will be around, but the, the second question that pops in our head then, yeah. just a natural humanistic thing is like, well, we're all about our survival. So that's the first thing. But then like, wait, this guy's saying I'm fine. Potentially I could be okay. But who the heck is this guy anyways? Should I trust yeah. Brian? I'm nobody. So, yeah. yeah he's nobody. Exactly. He's yeah, nobody yeah. and he knows nothing about what we do. But Not much. Brian, so why don't you tell people why they might want to pay attention at all to to what your opinion is. Yeah. Right? Because so, we all have our own opinion. Okay. Yeah, completely. Um, so yeah, I'm a homeowner who's had three claims that needed adjusting on site, but that's not really why I would have an opinion on this. So um, <laughs> I've been a PNC guy for over 20 years. Um, my last role on the carrier side, I've worked for a few carriers and I was a consultant at McKinsey's. So I worked for, I got to see a lot of carriers and I, I did some pretty heavy claims work while I was there. Uh, but my last role at a carrier was chief claims officer. Um, so I ran claims for the U.S. business for Hiscox USA. And, you know, we used, we, we had our own folks on the desk, a lot of legal kind of claims, so, you know, a lot of attorneys in the mm -hmm. team, but we have plenty of field adjusting going on through some awesome partners that we worked with. And yeah, we used some of the newer technology as of the we go look kind of stuff that was going on out there. But a lot of stuff, y you need someone who's going to climb that roof or get in where a drone's not going to see or whatever. And by the way, in a lot of those cases, there's a public adjuster knocking on doors yeah. and drones don't really do anything in that kind of setting. They're not going to beat that public adjuster and, and uh, you know, help you navigate that by making a human connection, which is what that, that public adjuster is working off of. Yeah, um, totally. So I, I was a consumer of IA services, um, an insider in the industry. And so I, I know a thing or two about the subject um, I've been the buyer of it. I've been a decision maker and a strategic thinker in it. And um, the benefactor I, of it in some cases. Benefactor yeah. as well. And and I left Hiscox to go to an insure tech startup that is primarily claims focused. Um, it's a company called Hi Marley that does texting and the, the starting use case was in claims. And that's why I knew them as I was one of their early customers. So I've been in this space and I've been in a part of it that is about some of the disruption or the enablement is another way to put it. Because mm -hmm. Hi Marley's not trying to put anyone out of work. It's just trying to help us how we do our job. Um, so I was seeing a lot of this, like, here's a new technology. Well, what does that mean for the way we've always worked and the people who have worked that way? So that's why I say it'll be different. Um, but I've seen that all happening firsthand and I've seen the seeds that are being sowed today for what adjusting is going to look like five, 10, 15 years from now, although 15 years, it's a long time, even in insurance, given, uh, you know, totally. a lot of stuff that's out there, but I think people will still be around. I think the numbers may be different. And to be fair, a lot of us are retiring and not being replaced at the same rate. So I don't know if that's actually a problem. I think there's going to be natural attrition that will lend itself to that tech shift. But the work that an IA does and the tools they use, a lot of IAs are really good with drones now. Like drones aren't yeah. putting you out of work. That's one of your core competencies. Um, and someone's still got to do something with all the images that come out of there, especially in property adjusting. It's yeah. auto's a little bit different, but um, I still see a future for it. And yeah, it's a different future, but it's not, you know, it, it's, not a, it's not fully automating out the space at all. I don't see that. I, well, shifting a little bit to, to your book, and you talk about this, is how, um, you know, disruption in, implies that, like, taxis used to be the only way to get a ride, and now yeah. Uber and Lyft are like, you're like, what's a taxi? Who cares about yeah. taxi? They got disrupted. There yep. was no longer taxis. Like, that's yeah. not something I use ever, and I would even want to use. That's yeah. a disruption but you're kind of talking about insurances, the changes that are coming and the changes that have come, let's be fair, since the 90s, yeah. digital imaging, electronic estimating, uh, you know, buying policies online, all the things you talk about in your book, um, that's not disruption as much as it is the evolution, which is you know, the subtitle of your book. Yeah. And so I loved that because we do all get scared that like, oh, the camera's gonna take my place. That happened in the 90s. Yeah. Oh. You yeah, don't need me to do Polaroids anymore. I'm fired. I'm going to get law. I'm yeah. going to get replaced. And it's like, no, there's still people. But um, that insurance companies, they're probably not changing so much that they're throwing out the baby with the bathwater, which implies yeah. we're still going to be involved. So 
what are you seeing as the next kind of shift? You didn't really talk about this much. Rob in his book, The End of Insurance, we know it, kind of gave some ideas of where it could go. You gave some case yeah. studies, which we'll get yep. to in a minute, which are amazing. Yeah. Like, what do you see is like this shift? Let's say, let's start with maybe in claims that yeah. might be coming. You hinted to it, drones, obviously. Um, is They're already here. here. Yeah, I mean, that's yeah. here. Yeah. But, but what do you see in coming down the pipe uh, with everything that's going on on COVID and otherwise? But yeah. Well, and I do think these two words, disruption and evolution, to me, disruption is what everyone talks about right now. And it's a scary threat. And, and look, my role in InsureTech was sales. So I was going around to, you know, my former peers and hearing about how they feel stuck. Like, you know, all these reasons why we can't move ahead and we can't keep up with the startup carriers that don't have any of the baggage we have. And they feel a disruptive threat, either because customers' demands are shifting really rapidly because of everything else they do in their life. And just like COVID, like now everyone does Zoom, like kids are on Zoom now. Like that wasn't going on so, so long ago. So like, that's an expectation, no. you know? Um, yeah. And maybe we wish it wasn't happening, but like the way people live and the way they transact in every other aspect, it's, people use the term like the Amazonification, if you can say it, um, like that's going on everywhere. So the expectations there and they're pushing the carriers be like, what do you mean I have to wait for a paper check? What do you mean I have to get this notarized and mail it into you? Oh, I can fax it too. Do you like, no. So the customer side, oh, okay, in our industry, it's like doctors, lawyers, and insurance. Those are three places that they, and every carrier wants them gone. There's no question, but there's, there's like six agents yeah. out there who are still faxing. Um, so, you know, we're, we're getting a disruptive push from there and we're getting it from some of these startups. And it's not dissimilar to what we saw like in 2000, where it was, you know, you're hinting at it or maybe in the 90s where it was like, I remember there's a company called Global Risk Exchange that was predicting the end of brokers. And they're going to be this like all sales and commercial lines going to go through GRX and like brokers will be a thing of the past. Well, GRX doesn't exist today. And brokers do. <laughs> I, um, brokers are still there. I, I've brokers heard of are them. still here. I haven't yeah. heard of the other guys. <laughs> yeah, there's brokers and broke in. Um, look, it's a great idea. Maybe it was ahead of its time, but we see similar kinds of things going on today. But you don't see the hubris of like brokers, agents. That's ridiculous. You don't need that anymore. Like we're going to put them all out of business. Most of the digital distribution actually they've pivoted to enabling agents and brokers. So like, we think this channel is going to stick around. And so we want to be one of the tools they use. We're not going to sit here and be like, we're going to put them out of business and go the way of, of the folks that came out in, you know, 99, 2000. Um, I think that you're going to, and, and I talked a little bit about this um, in terms of the theme of like, they're going to be disruptors. Some of them will succeed. Some of them won't. Some of them will still be here down the road. And some of them will still be here only not on their own. They'll be a part of, some bigger already existing incumbent player who buys them for the technology, the movement, kind of like what happened with insurance. You know, like insurance was right. innovative back in the day, eventually ended up as part of Allstate, still a separate brand, and now they're not. Now they're totally folded in. There is no separate insurance anymore. Um, you know, like I think that path is the most likely is unique carriers who can afford to make a tens to hundreds to maybe billions of dollars of, uh, you know, not tens of dollars, tens of, of millions, hundreds of millions to, yeah. to low billions, maybe. Yeah. yeah. Um, that kind of acquisition. And there's plenty of them that can do that. Maybe not today. Maybe they want to sit on their cash right now, rightfully so. Yeah. But, um, you know, do I think that State Farm and Allstate and Nationwide and Geico and whoever else won't exist 10 years from now and it's going to be Lemonade and Root and Hippo and, and no what? Like, no, I don't. I think some of those players will be around. You know, some of those small guys, well, you know, some of the consumer, big guys may not. Just me. Yeah, yeah. Even as a consumer of insurance, right? I'm not so much on the agent side, so I'm not tracking too much of the lemonade and all this stuff. You yeah. Know, yeah. Guys talking about on the INS nerd side of things, but I'm like watching and I'm going and all my browsing for insurance for my car, or my boat or whatever. I, I don't, nothing comes up that I need to try lemonade. Yeah. It's progressive. It's all state. Right. It's USAA. It's state farm. And so, that's a big lead that the incumbents have that I don't care how fast you are as a startup. Yeah. The, the, the brand identity, even just from that aspect alone, yeah. from a consumer standpoint, it's like you're mass, you're, you're decades. You're yeah. Decades from that. Yeah. So I think there's, there's two key points for this. One is what are the startups really good at? They're really good at the customer experience side, which is that pressure 
that the carriers are facing. Mm -hmm. So they're coming in clean slate and they're like, we're going to only do digital payments and we're going to, you know, you're going to apply for your insurance by taking a picture of the product. And, you know, we'll use like Amazon's got their service that can identify any, like we'll figure out what it is. You want to like, that's all awesome. Do that, do that all day. And eventually the incumbent carriers will have similar technologies either because they bought you or because like, look it's table stakes now and so they're going to get with the program like electronic payments is not new it's not relegated to a couple of new carriers or you know like i remember uh i used to work for liberty mutual back in the day and a guy rear-ended me and like you know the adjuster came out and he had a printer in his minivan his liberty minivan and like printed the check on the spot and i was like that's incredible well like yeah at the time it was and and that was you know like it was more rare back then but now like yeah. not only are they not doing that you just get paid like you send in the photos you might even get paid while you're on the side of the highway with your car undrivable waiting for the tow truck like it, yeah there's there's a lot that's changed i think the same thing will happen here is that you'll see the technologies will proliferate so some of the disruptive stuff will become norms and everyone will start to use them. The other piece of it is kind of what you were hitting at, that like that lead, there's expertise that comes with it. And this is what the startups generally have struggled with. They're really good on what I would call the easy part. And it's not to dismiss the customer experience, but right. there's so much innovation and technology and capability to do a great customer experience. You know, it's for really hard in insurance, the insurance part the risk management, the capital management, frequency and severity. Yeah. <laughs> Some so, money. I mean, yeah. like, when, when Irma, Harvey, and, and Maria all hit back to back to back, Yeah. and you're hugely liable and, and vulnerable in Florida as, a, as, a, as an insurance company, can you roll with that? Like, yeah. And do you have the clout to get the IAs to work with you? For, like, you know, you're a hundred million yeah. startup carrier. Do you think you're going to compete with State Farm? or USAA or Geico or whoever for IA yeah. capacity in Florida? No, absolutely not. Yeah. The guy who handled my fence had just come from Florida and he lives in like Nevada or something. Cause he's like, you know, carrier, I'm not going to name my carrier. Like they had him going all over cause, and he responds to him. Like, you know, the startups, it's, it's experience, it's clout, it's capability. And that's where you see them financially, if not for some major investment dollars, a lot of them wouldn't still exist. Um, and I'm not, it's not to knock them, but that's the hard part of insurance and they haven't gotten that as right. And so that's where I think actually it's a marriage of the two and Kerber Honig, the guy who founded ITC or co-founded it, um, you know, he commented on this, he wrote the forward for my book and it's sort of the same thing. It's, it's actually the marriage of the two. And that's where I see long-term like, so, you know, cool new adjusting technology, there's a threat and maybe the hubris from the company behind it. It's like, we're going to put IA, like that's the stupidest thing, IA is. You'll never have someone walking on your property waiting for them to take photos and it's just going to happen, satellites and whatever. Well, what if you give those photos to someone who actually gets the complexity of what's going on, has actually been through it and also has predictive models and AI that's helping them to go through it. And so you pull all that together then you've really got something. It's not just the AI. It's not just the drone. It's not just the whatever. It's the bringing it together with an expert that has the empathy and the, the f- customer relationship. I think that's what will continue in the future. So it's almost like RoboCop, but for adjusting. Yeah, yeah, you know? totally. And, and what ends up, what I end up seeing a lot, because uh, as we're training and mentoring new people is, you know, the number one question is, will there still be a job in three to five years? And I'm like, yes. And here's why. And actually, if you position yourself well, when that technology, the disruptive technology comes in, you go from being a commodity to an expert overnight because anybody new who comes in has no idea how to do it the old way, right? right? Like they they can't write a legitimate estimate. They don't understand what is built off of because they're used to just hitting buttons or a drone or Eagle view telling them, I had to measure a roof. What are you talking about? I don't know how to do that, right? So all of a sudden you become elevated if you stick with it and you roll with the technology. You're like, no, now you're the legacy guy, right? You actually yeah. know how the job's done and what the, like you're saying, the technology is built on. What is that model? Where does that come from? Well, I don't know. It's some spaghetti things on the screen. Well, yeah. actually there, there's- you know, Right, there's something behind, behind that, yeah. yeah. So, it's, it's like GPS. GPS and phone numbers are two things. Like no one knows where they're going and ask, ask like, I don't know, you know, my dad's cell phone number. 
his his cell phone number is scroll scroll tap like i I don't know what that is because i have i've never as long as he's had a cell phone i have and he's been an entry in there so like i have no clue what his phone number is that's like when a new person who's just got the surface level like oh i just enter these photos and it spits out a number like well you're not an adjuster you're a data entry person so like there's an expertise that's missing there and like we're always going to have cats unfortunately. And the weather patterns are not suggesting that it's going to calm down. The weather is more unstable. So that is the kind of thing that, yes, it's great to have drones and they can hit a number of roofs really fast. There's still people out there and there will always need to be, and there's rubble to pull through. And like, it's still a field adjusting game and it will always, as long as there's weather and there's going to always be weather, there's going to be some level of demand for that expertise. So if you keep fostering that, I, I do think there is still a future in this industry. Since you were a claims guy and not just like an individual claims guy, you saw lots of claims on a grand scale. What's the number one most annoying thing that independent adjusters do that if you could change with snap of your fingers, you would change? Yeah, it's responsiveness. And what I'm not going to presume is there's anything intentional, malicious, incompetence or any of that. Like everyone's plate's too full. The tools you have, probably aren't good enough for what you're trying to do and you're in the car all day or you're seeing people all day so it's really hard um this is a general rule for claims if you if you have a customer who's asking you for updates once is one thing but if they have to chase you for anything that's like you've claims in jd power people who've had claims generally have higher customer sat the ones who don't are the ones who it's painful because like they're actually getting the value for their policy and it's a bad moment in their life. So it's like the, they've opened the door for you to make them whole again. If you screw that up, it's all over. Because it's like you made things harder on them when it was already hard. So if it's hard for you to, to, as a carrier, to hear back from that IA and you're chasing, and I've had this where like we spent two weeks chasing an IA in Minnesota. And I know like hailstorm, it's rough. Well, in that two weeks, we had three public adjusters come in and claims that should have been contained within a hundred grand. We now had lawsuit threats for seven figures. And it was, I mean, the whole thing was not like, I don't need to paint that whole picture, but we know like yeah, exactly. not justified, huge waste of time for everyone. The insured was furious with us because this guy's telling them how we're screwing them over and they could have had all this money. And so we need to know, you know, so finding either finding a way to structure your day so you can, do those turnarounds and maybe it's part of your evening and that's not great. If you're on the road, maybe that's easy. You know, if you're, you're staying away from home, but figuring out how you can keep in touch in addition to your workload. And that might mean, you know, this is a problem. So maybe there's technologies that can help with that rather than starting with the tech. But I, from my perspective, that's the number one thing I worry about. And if I think about the only times I've had to call in, like, you know, we get a penalty from a DOI or a lawsuit ensues and there's coverage discussion. It's, it, invariably if there's an IA involved if it's anything to do with them it's responsiveness otherwise it's like you know it has nothing to do with the way the claim was adjusted but the only time it lands on an IA it's not because they did a bad job with the adjusting like you guys know what you're doing you know right training right tools at your hands it's because something fell through the cracks and so we couldn't get on it when we should have so responsiveness. That's why you do it in the morning first thing. You block out your first hour to status all your files. That's well, know yourself. Like if that's how you work, awesome. If you're a night person, awesome. If you need to break in the middle, like whatever it is, I'm not going to tell someone whether it's like do it. I'm a morning person, so I'm going to do it in the morning Yeah. That's before good. the I'm emails start coming in. Yep. So that's why like 100% I agree with you. But at least like if that's not working for you, be honest about that, but figure out what does. Because if it doesn't, this may not be the right space for you to work in because it really does matter here. It's not just about coming up with the dollars for that, you know, that, that uh, devastation that's going on. It's about how you manage the whole process and you got to communicate. I would say it's probably the like estimating. We always overinflate the importance and then the most important piece falls away. And it's yeah. like, we've got to communicate where the hands and the feet, the mouth and the ears <laughs> like yeah. in the field. We can't forget that part. So, and the but- estimating is where the tech is pushing in. So like, that's the piece that's under threat from a disruption standpoint the human side is not, and that's all the communication's about. Yep. You can't replace humanity in that place. Not yet, yeah. anyways. We haven't figured yeah. that one out. So, Brian, I appreciate you taking the time today, a lot of time today. Um, why don't you tell everybody about your book real quick and where they can find it and, you know, why they should yeah. buy it? 
Yeah, so it's called the future of insurance from disruption to evolution. You called out, you know, at the top of the the interview. Um, this is this is kind of the story we've been talking about. This is a point of disruption in our industry that's not like the past times where those were enabling technologies. You know, those are things that yeah, there's a lot of talk, but like actually they could just make things better. There's that going on right now too, no doubt. But there's also disruptive new technologies coming about that could put a threat to some piece of the puzzle including carriers, which is new. You know, we mentioned insurance, but it's not normal that you have 80 new carriers start up in a single year and none of them have any financial history. They're all tech companies. Like that's very different. So the industry is seeing that pressure along with this customer expectation pressure. This is a different situation. And from my perspective, those conversations I had being on the tech side, carriers feel stuck. And it's not just carriers, agents feel stuck. IAs feel stuck. We feel like, you know, all the reasons we've been talking about why we can't or we struggle to move ahead or move ahead as quickly as we want to, you know, a year, 15 months, whatever it is for something that sounds simple, but some carriers are doing it. And I'm not talking about reinventing themselves completely. I'm talking about finding places where there's a problem and they find a way to solve it. And in doing that, they move their culture forward. They move their ability to innovate forward. That's what I like. It's a story of hope, really. So seven cases of seven carriers who were really honest with me, firsthand discussions with them. You know, this is not like I didn't just scan press releases and whatnot. Like I got into the businesses and talked to the people and found out what did you do, but how'd you do it? And what lessons did you learn? And where did you take a wrong turn that, you know, you learned something from? Pull out those insights so that you can maybe find a bit of inspiration for your own situation, maybe not make some of those same mistakes. And like, you know, we talked about CSA took them a year and they do it faster now. Well, what if you can jump in post that one year experience and do just do the faster part? Um, so I, I share that information with everyone. And I don't think this is just carriers. I think this is anyone in the insurance space, including some of those startups who are trying to serve the insurance space, but also, you know, the IAs, the brokers, the agents, mutual stock companies, or it doesn't matter. We're all in this game together. We all so, are looking for problems to solve. So we're, we're facing more the same insurance yep. ultimately. So um, I, I think the discussion is one, all of us in the industry should be having, and I'm really lucky to have gotten these carriers to participate and to share the way that they did and, you know, try to use my experience to bring more of that story out. And um, you've had nice things to say about it so far, and that's been the feedback. So hopefully, you know, it, it resonates with people and it's, it's going live uh, June 24th, but it's available for pre-order now. And the easiest way to get it is just go to future-of-insurance.com. You need the dashes. Um, so future-of-insurance.com is more info on it and there's a link to pre-order and it's coming out in every format. You can get Audible, will be out in a few weeks. So however you want to take it in, it'll be there for you. Did you do your own audio book? I did. Yes. So, it's miserable, but it's necessary. It's like it, no one likes to listen to their voice that much. Yeah, yeah, I, I totally understand. That's awesome. And for those of you who are listening and or watching and you're going, reading an insurance book, you know, not exactly sounding like a great time. It's <laughs> too, uh, too much insurance tech and, and technology and language for me. It really is a, a easy read. And the way that it's written, you can kind of jump around to different sections. You can kind yeah. of understand the problem that the incumbent insurance companies have. You can just take one case study at a time and read it and go, wow, I never thought about that. Or you can just jump to the end and go, what can we learn from all yeah. this? How do we move forward? So great job, Brian. I think it's a great book. Thanks, I did Chris. not get to read every single word yet. I will. Um, but, you know, moving forward, just um, keep sharing what you're learning. It's so fun uh, to have you guys and Tony and everybody at INS Nerds helping collaborate projects like this to push it out because it'd be one thing if you're just sitting in the corner trying to write it and then push it yeah. out, but to have all of INS nerds pushing it and participating, it's cool that we can all be a part of it. That's the benefit of this being a relationship business. Like it's about all the people. So if we don't work together, what's the point? Yeah. So yeah, it's been, it's been a lot of fun and it's great to have everyone's support. Awesome, man. Well, thank you so much for your time. Thanks, Chris.